controllers and treasurers, I'd like to welcome you to today's national webinar entitled GASB Review 20, 2015. My name is Kenny Pointer and I'm the Executive Director of NASAC and I'll be serving as your host for today's event. We're joined today by approximately 1,200 government accountants and auditors and other interested parties from 102 different locations across the United States. As fiscal year end for most state governments just ended and a new year begins, it's an opportune time for financial statement preparers and auditors to get a refresher on the standards that will be effective for June 30, 2015 financial statements, as well as recently released GASB statements that will require our attention in fiscal year 2016. Today's webinar will provide must-know guidance on previous, previously issued GASB statements that are effective for June 30, 2015 and 2016. Of course, for 2015, these statements include Statement 68, one of our favorites, pensions for employers, Statement 69, government combinations and disposals of government operations, Statement 71, pension transition for contributions made subsequent to the measurement date. Statements effective for fiscal 2016 include Statement 72, fair value, measurement and application. Statement 73, the pensions, related assets outside of the scope of Statements 67 and 68, as well as Statement 67 and 68 amendments. Statement 76, on the gap hierarchy. We'll also cover other recently issued GASB statements. These include Statement 74, OPEB, other post-employment benefits, for the plans and their reporting, as well as Statement 75, OPEB for employers. Time permitting, two additional topics will also be discussed today. These include tax abatements, which are expected, expected to be Statement 77 with an effective date of 2017, and also external investment pools, which is expected to be Statement 78 with an effective date of 2016. We're really lucky today to have with us GASB Chairman Dave Vout, uh, Dave Bean, Director of Research and Technical Activities, Senior Technical Advisor Ken Sherman, Project Manager Scott Reeser, and Project Manager Jalan Su. And more information on all of our speakers today can be found in their bios, which were distributed to you in advance of today's event. Today we're going to do things a little bit different in terms of Q&A. We're going to take breaks uh, during the presentation to allow for questions and answers. Uh, this is a little bit different approach than we've taken in the past, but we, hope, we are hopeful that this will break up the presentation into more manageable segments and make it seem a little bit more interactive. Some comments that we've received uh, from participants over the past. Today, as always, we are allowing participants to receive audio through either their computer or their phone. And to ask a question, please use the raise your hand function of our webinar software and simply click on the hand icon that's located in the toolbar. Now just remember, if you are asking a question using your computer, asking that question live, uh, your computer must have a microphone for that process to work properly. If you prefer, and many of you do, you can simply send us your question by using the questions tab located in the webinar toolbar on the right hand side of your screen. Simply type in your question and submit it at any time during today's webinar. Speakers today will be using a PowerPoint presentation, which you should be able to see on your screen, and handouts were provided to you in advance. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties at all, please give us a call. Our number here is 859-276-1147. Again, that number is 859-276-1147. Just one housekeeping uh, last announcement. In order for NASAC to be approved by the National State Boards of Accountancy, as a group internet-based provider of CPE. We have implemented some attendance monitoring tools for individuals, and I believe there are 52 individuals participating today. Uh, this applies only to those of you going solo, does not apply to groups. So in order to verify your attendance as individuals, you'll need to reply to periodic requests that will be sent to the chat toolbar. You can drag this toolbar off to another part of your screen to make this functionality easier uh, if you prefer. Simply watch for these periodic prompts and make sure that you do respond. Your response will provide us, of course, with a written record and a documented record of your attendance today. Uh, we started this as a new method so that we don't interrupt the uh, speaker's presentations. 
Those attending as a group, your attendance will be confirmed by your room monitor, so you will not receive these, these prompts throughout the presentation. So for individuals, you will be, should be receiving your first attendance prop in the chat toolbar, and we will be testing your attendance later in today's webinar. Obviously, these internal controls allow us to better comply with NASBA rules for granting continuing professional education credits. We have a very, very full agenda today, and again, I want to express my gratitude to all of our speakers for taking time for their busy schedules to be with us today to share their knowledge and experience. And with that as a very brief background, let me turn the program over to Dave Bout. Mr. Chairman, welcome to today's webinar. Kenny, thank you. The GASB appreciates this opportunity to provide an annual standards update. Uh, I'm going to kick off today's session with just a, a quick graphic look at some of the standards that we'll be covering. Kenny mentioned all these, but you can see in 2015, the big one is pensions for employers. 2016, it's going to be fair value measurement and application. 2017, we're going to start to see the OPEB standards kick in, and then finally in 2018, we'll have the OPEB for employers. Also, when we take a look at the standards that we have currently in development, we have two standards we're working on currently. One will be statement number 78 on external investment pools. We're looking that this will actually be effective probably in 2016, and that's primarily driven by the SEC rule changes to 2A7, which will take effect in 2016. And then we're working on Statement 77, Tax Abatement Disclosures, and we're looking at that one becoming effective in 2017. I will tell you the board very carefully considers the effective dates as we uh, look at standards, uh, looking at the standards that are currently out there that will be coming into effect and trying to make sure that we don't have all of them coming to effect at the same time. So with that quick look ahead, I'm going to turn it over to Scott, who's going to talk to you about pensions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're going to start with, uh, as Kenny, I guess, alluded to earlier, a favorite, uh, Statement 68, which uh, has been out for about three years now. And as the first effective date slide showed, it's effective for fiscal years beginning after June 15, 2014, which means now. Um, so for June 30th year ends, which I know most of the states have June 30th year ends, uh, their June 30th, 15 financial statements should reflect uh, their pensions that are provided to their employees uh, based on the requirements in Statement 68. Uh, statement 68 covers both defined contribution pensions and defined benefit pensions, uh, but today we're going to spend most of our time, in fact all of it, talking about defined uh, benefit pensions. There are minimal changes uh, for defined contribution pensions. Uh, statement 68, as you're aware, uh, and we've been talking to you the last few years in this update on, is limited to pensions provided through trusts that meet certain criteria. Uh, those three criteria are the contributions from employers and non-employer contributing entities are irrevocable, uh, with the exception that refunds back to the employers for uh, amounts contributed to for employees that are non-vested can occur. Uh, two, plan assets dedicated to providing pensions in accordance with the pension benefit terms. Uh, and three, plan assets are legally protected from creditors of employers, non-employer contributing entities, and a pension plan administer or administrator. And then in circumstances of defined benefit pensions, uh, also uh, the plan assets are legally protected from the employee uh, as well. Uh, statement 68 significantly revises the recognition, measurement, and disclosure requirements uh, for governments that provide pensions. Uh, as you recall, under Statement 27, uh, the liability recognized for pensions was the net pension obligation, which was generally the difference between uh, the cumulative uh, amounts contributed to the retirement system and the annual required contributions for each year that uh, Statement 27 required that amount to be contributed. And so for those governments that contributed their annual required contribution each year, they were reporting no uh, liability. Uh, under Statement 27, generally, or what was called the unfunded actuarial accrued liability, uh, in addition to the uh, Actuarial value of assets and actuarial accrued liability were disclosed in the notes to the financial statements. Uh, under Statement 68, the 
that amount measured a little bit differently as we'll talk about over the next few slides generally will be what's reported as the liability and that will be titled the net pension liability as you can see in the middle of slide seven and the net pension liability will be measured as the total pension liability which is the actuarial value or actuarial present value of projected benefit payments that have been attributed to prior service uh, net of the pension plan's fiduciary net position uh, as of the measurement date. Uh, why I say as of the measurement date is statement 68 allows for the measurement of the net pension liability to be as of a date different than the date of the employer's financial statements. It must be as of a date within one year in one day of the employer's financial statements. So for the June 30th, 2015 uh, financial statements that are going to be prepared, audited, and uh, made public over the next several months, uh, that means the measurement date must be sometime between June 30th, 2014 and June 30th, 2015. Uh, and we'll talk about in a little bit when we talk about expense recognition, why the measurement date uh, can come into play in some circumstances and uh, some additional uh, accounting that needs to be done when the different, uh, when a measurement date different than the employer's fiscal year in is chosen. Uh, in addition to changing the way the liability is recognized, rather than, uh, as in Statement 27, the annual pension cost, uh, being reported as pension expense. Instead, generally, the change in the net pension liability, with a couple exceptions, uh, will be recognized uh, in pension expense. And the result of that is more uh, items that affect the change in the net pension liability will be recognized in the period in which they occur. Uh, and those items that are not recognized in pension expense in the period in which they occur and are recognized as deferred inflows of resources or deferred outflows of resources generally be, will be recognized uh, over a shorter period in the pension expense than they were uh, under Statement 27. Uh, so the next slide goes into uh, the first step in the measurement of the total pension liability that is required by Statement 68. And generally, this process is the same as under Statement 27 for the calculation of the actuarially accrued liability. Uh, and that is, actuaries are going to project benefit payments, discount them back to a present value, and then attribute them to periods of service. Uh, and that, as I said, is the same under Statement 68 as it was under Statement 27. Uh, we're going to, however, in each of those three steps, have some uh, differences between what uh, the parameters that the actuaries are allowed to follow uh, in doing those steps. Uh, the first, as I said on this slide covered, is projection. And generally, there's very few changes uh, in this step than were in Statement 27. Uh, the benefits uh, terms drive what is projected, and so what those terms are as of the measurement date should be projected out into the future using actuarial assumptions. Uh, that should be done for current employees and uh, current inactive employees. Uh, so all those uh, individuals that are members of the pension plan as of the measurement date, uh, these estimated future benefit payments uh, should be projected. Uh, and at the bottom of the screen there, you see some of the uh, variables that come into play. The bottom one is the one that uh, Statement 68 specifically addresses that was not addressed in Statement 27, uh, and that is ad hoc post-employment benefit changes, or basically ad hoc COLAs. Uh, as you can see above, Statement 27 talked about that automatic COLAs should be considered in the uh, projection of future benefit payments because they are part of the benefit terms uh, as of the date of the measurement. Uh, but something staff over the years has gotten a lot of questions on are, well, we have this uh, benefit changes that are approved every year. Should those be included as well? And every year they come up uh, for a vote uh, 
uh, we'll say for example if it's a city uh, at the city council meeting and every year they're approved are those automatic or are they ad hoc and the board you know deliberated the issue and uh, first of all they believe that if they are ad hoc they generally should be considered ad hoc that is if they you know there's a circumstance or a condition that needs to be met prior to them uh, being uh, approved and that condition uh, is something like a future vote rather than uh, an occurrence that can be predicted whether it will happen or not uh, but in some circumstances they occur all the time and both the employer and the employee basically treat them as part of the substantive plan uh, and in those circumstances and that is if the ad hoc COLA is considered to be substantively automatic the board believes that they should be considered uh, in the projection of benefits and so that means that they're not considered to be substantively automatic they would not be considered in that projection uh, and would not be included in changes in the uh, uh, projected liability until those uh, ad hoc COLAs were approved second step uh, in the measurement of the total pension liability is discounting the projected benefit back to a present value uh, that is done by use of a single discount rate uh, statement 68 requires that rate to be the long-term expected rate of return on pension plan investments to the extent that uh, the pension plan's net position is projected to be sufficient to make the pension benefit payments uh, and the pension plan net position uh, is expected to be invested using a strategy to achieve uh, that return so in some cases if both those two conditions are always met uh, the discount rate used by the pension plan will be the long-term expected rate return uh, however if there are future benefit periods uh, in which those conditions are not expected uh, to occur then as you can see in the bottom bullet of that screen uh, the rate for a 20-year tax exempt general obligation municipal bond uh, that is rated double A or higher uh, should be used uh, and that uh, for the rest of this presentation I will just refer to that as the muni bond uh, rate um, and so in those circumstances there are going to be some future benefit payments that are going to be discounted using that muni bond rate and some using the long-term expected rate of return and the standard goes through the process you go through to calculate uh, the single discount rate that blends those two uh, rates together now uh, one more note before we jump away from this slide uh, in circumstances where the long-term expected rate of return is not the discount rate that is some portion of the muni bond rate had to be used to determine the discount rate that generally from period to period uh, the discount rate is going to change uh, and that can be a result of two things one uh, the fact that that muni rate has changed from the prior measurement date uh, so uh, you're using a different uh, rate to discount those benefit payments that are out into the future in which the long-term expected rate of return is not able to be used uh, to, or I should say the pension plan net position is not projected to be sufficient to pay those benefits and invested to uh, achieve that return uh, and number two you may have a different uh, allocation of how much of those benefits uh, have met that uh, uh, amount uh, and so generally as I said that when the long-term expected rate of return is not used to discount or is not equal to the discount rate the discount rate will be changing from period to period uh, third step here in the uh, calculation of the total pension liability uh, is the attribution of those uh, discounted projected benefit payments uh, unlike statement 27 which allows one of six methods to be used to uh, attribute uh, the discounted projected benefits to periods of service statement 68 uh, only requires one method and that is the entry age actuarial cost method uh, it should be applied as level percentage of pay should be applied to each individual and the concept is to apply uh, the amount from the first period in which the individual starts uh, working 
uh, and could become eligible to be a, uh, receive benefits at some period in the future to all estimated periods in which the employee uh, is expected to work. And the, as it says on that last bullet, uh, the same benefit terms to determine service cost as to determine the actual present value projected benefit payments should be uh, used in the, uh, excuse me, the entry age uh, method. So that's the determination of the total pension liability. Uh, as I said before, the net pension liability, the liability that will be uh, recorded uh, on the financial statements of the government will be the total pension liability minus the fiduciary uh, or the fiduciary net position of the pension plan uh, as it is reported. That is a slight change from statement 27 in the fact that it is, you know, the amount as reported by the fiduciary plan or the pension plan in its financial statements, which generally means that the plan net investments at fair value as of that date. Um, changes in that net pension liability, uh, as I said before, generally will be recognized in the period in which they uh, affect the net pension liability. And for example, service costs, interest on the total pension liability during the year, the effects of uh, benefit changes, things of that nature will be recognized in the current period. Uh, exceptions that will be recognized as deferred inflows of resources or deferred outflows of resources uh, are differences between expected and actual experience uh, in the determination of the total pension liability. Uh, for example, say employees are living a little longer than expected uh, or some employees retired a little sooner than uh, was expected, things of that nature. Uh, in addition, changes in assumptions used to determine the total pension liability will not always be recognized in expense in the period in which uh, they affect the total pension liability. Uh, those two amounts we recognize as deferred inflows of resources or deferred outflows of resources related to pensions, and they will be uh, recognized uh, beginning in the current period uh, over a closed period equal to the average remaining service life of all the employees that are provided with pension. Uh, so as opposed to Statement 27, which generally had all uh, changes in the uh, actuarial, unfunded actuarial accrued liability recognized over a period of up to 30 years, uh, this will be recognized as components of pension expense over a shorted period. Uh, the third bullet there under the exceptions, differences between projected and actual earnings on pension plan investments. Uh, those amounts will be recognized as deferred inflows of resources or deferred outflows of resources related to pensions. We recognize beginning in the current period over a closed five-year period. Uh, and so one-fifth of all those differences will be recognized in pension expense in the current period and one-fifth in each of the next four periods will increase or decrease pension experience, or I'm sorry, pension expense as appropriate. Uh, the fourth item we have listed there under exceptions are employer contributions. Uh, now in theory, employer contributions do not uh, impact pension expense. Uh, in theory, the employer contribution, if it's a single employer plan, is just the payment of liability. It's not an income statement uh, item. Uh, however, because uh, as I talked about earlier, the measurement date could be different uh, than the employer's fiscal year end date, uh, we have to account in some way for those contributions that were made between the measurement date and the employer's fiscal year end. And how that will be done is those amounts will be shown as a deferred outflow of resources. Uh, and then next, in the next period, they will be in the contributions or it should be, say, in the plan fiduciary net position that's determined uh, in, or used in the determination of the net pension liability in that next period. Uh, now, Kenny had gone through the uh, effective date of the various statements at the beginning of the presentation. And one of the statements he mentioned was Statement 71. We have no specific slides on Statement 71, uh, but one of the transition provisions uh, in Statement 68 
was that if you cannot determine uh, all prior deferred outflows of resources or deferred inflows of resources related to pension uh, at the date of implementation, that you would just calculate those amounts prospectively. Statement 71 came in and said, well, if you use a different measurement date at implementation, you still should recognize, or I should say, you still should report deferred outflows of resources for those employer contributions that were made subsequent to that measurement date at implementation and the uh, beginning of the fiscal period in which Statement 68 uh, was implemented. Now, I should have said at the beginning uh, of all this measurement discussion that everything I've talked about so far uh, generally relates to single and agent employers, and it still will relate to cost-sharing employers, but we're going to throw a couple more uh, items to consider for those cost-sharing employers in their determination of the liability to be uh, reported and recognized. Uh, under Statement 27, uh, cost-sharing employers only recognize liability if they did not make their contractually required contributions to the pension plan. So as long as their contractually required contributions were made to the pension plan, no liabilities were reported. Uh, Statement 68, on the other hand, requires that the cost-sharing employers that participate in a cost-sharing pension plan to recognize their proportionate share of the collective net pension liability, pension expense, deferred outflows of resources, deferred inflows of resources of the cost-sharing plan, similar to the way that we talked about before for single employers. Uh, Statement 68 requires that proportionate share uh, to be calculated using the employer's proportion of, in relation to all contributing entities to the cost-sharing plan, uh, and that proportion to be based in a manner consistent with the way that contributions are assessed to the pension plan. Uh, the board encouraged uh, the use of a long-term projected contribution effort to be the basis uh, for that proportion because in theory that is the contributions that will ultimately be made to the plan. Uh, but how, however, it is to be consistent, so it, and the board only encouraged the long-term contribution effort, so the current period uh, contributions can be used as the basis. Uh, so if an example, the employer contributed 40% of the contributions during the fiscal year of the plan to the plan, uh, and the uh, proportion is going to be based on the current year contributions. The employer would proportion would be 40%, and so 40% of the collective net pension liability will be recognized by the employer in its financial statements as its uh, liability related to pension. Now, because uh, of this manner in which we calculate the cost-sharing uh, liability. There are a couple individual employer expense items uh, that needs to be uh, accounted for. They're not on the slides. Uh, the first of which is that there's a change in the proportion from the prior period. Uh, and if there is a change in the proportion from the prior period, then the difference uh, uh, should be accounted for in the same manner we talked about as pension expense uh, for single employers as a difference between expected and actual or a change uh, in mm -hmm. assumption. Uh, and that is, it, that difference would be recognized as a deferred inflow of resources or deferred outflow of resources related to pensions uh, and recognized beginning in the current period over a uh, closed period uh, that reflects the average remaining service life of plan members. Uh, and the second of which is the change in the amount contributed, uh, or I'm sorry, a difference in the amount contributed to the proportion of contributions. Now this will only occur if the current, or the proportion is not based on current period contributions. The uh, proportion is based on current period contributions, there should be no difference. Uh, but if you're using a long-term expected contribution effort, you may have a difference between 
that allocation of the contributions that went to the plan and the amount that actually was contributed by that individual cost-sharing employer. And in those circumstances, they should be the difference or the effect should be accounted for in the same way uh, as a change in the proportion. Uh, statement 68 also addresses uh, situations in which non-employer contributing entities contribute to the pension plan. Uh, statement specifically addresses uh, those circumstances in which the non-employer contributing entity has a legal requirement to contribute uh, directly to the pension plan. In some of those circumstances, which we're going to talk about on this slide, uh, it's called a special funding situation. Uh, those situations uh, wanted are one of two additional requirements in addition to having the non-employer contributing entity being directly, uh, or I'm sorry, a having a legal requirement to contribute directly to the pension plan is required. The first of which is the contribution amount from the non-employer contributing entity uh, is not dependent upon events unrelated to pensions, uh, or the second requirement that it could meet is non-employer entity is the only entity with legal obligation to contribute. Um, so if the definition of a special funding situation is met, uh, then both the employer and the non-employer contributing entity uh, measure their uh, liabilities for pensions uh, for that pension plan uh, following the cost sharing uh, requirements. And that is non-employer contributing entity will recognize some proportion of the plan's uh, collective net pension liability. And the employers will recognize uh, another proportion uh, or the remaining proportion. If uh, it's a single employer plan, the result will be that the employer will also recognize revenue and expense for the amount uh, from the non-employer contributing entity which means the employer will still recognize the total pen collective pension expense of the pension plan. Uh, it's just a portion of it. They will also recognize uh, an amount for revenue uh, to offset the amount that's uh, being recognized by the non-employer contributing entity. Uh, and in a cost-sharing plan, they'll recognize additional expense uh, for the proportion of the contributions made by the non-employer contributing entity related to that employer's uh, employee. Statement also talks about situations uh, in which the non-employer contributing entity has a legal requirement to contribute, uh, but it doesn't meet the definition of a special funding situation. Uh, in those circumstances, the employer still follows the appropriate uh, recognition uh, guidance uh, of whether it's a single agent or cost-sharing employer, and then we just recognize revenue equal to the change in the net pension liability uh, from the contributions that were made by the non-employer contributing entity. Uh, and the non-employer contributing entity would just classify the expenses it makes during the period uh, as an expense in its financial statements. Uh, in fund level statements, uh, as a opposed to Statement 27, which specifically addressed guidance. Statement 68 did not address guidance, uh, only pensions in Statement 27 and OPEB in Statement 45. Uh, we found had specific guidance uh, in GASB literature as to ha how to allocate uh, long-term liabilities, and the board determined there was nothing uh, unique about pensions that required uh, specific guidance to be given. And so the general guidance from NCGA Statement 1, Paragraph 42, uh, should be followed. And that is, if uh, amounts are expected to be paid from proprietary funds, should be recognized uh, as liabilities uh, in those funds. Uh, however, there's no, as I said before, no specific guidance in Statement 68 as to how to specifically make that determination uh, no different than there is no guidance as to how to make that determination uh, for bonds, uh, leases, and similar liabilities that are allocated between multiple funds. Uh, next couple slides, we've got some sample note disclosures uh, that are new from Statement 68. Uh, first slide has some of the disclosures related to discount rate. 
uh, some of the information that's going to have to be disclosed is the long-term expected rate of return, how it was determined, uh, one of the ways that uh, more information related to that will be provided is the assumed asset allocation of the pension plan's portfolio should be disclosed, uh, and the long-term expected rate of return for each major asset class in that portfolio. Uh, and then, as you can see in the sample on the bottom of the screen, uh, what we refer to as the sensitivity disclosure uh, will be made, and that is what the effect uh, on the excuse me, on the net pension liability uh, will occur if a 1% increase or a 1% decrease is made to the discount rate. Uh, and so in that disclosure, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, um, it's in this example, the net pension liability is 751,753, and it shows what that net pension liability will be with a 1% increase and a 1% de decrease. Next slide, we show a disclosure that will occur, uh, and it shows it's for single and agent employers only, and that is the two components of the net pension liability, the total pension liability and the planned fiduciary net position, uh, beginning and ending of the year balances are shown, as is the effects of certain uh, events or causes in the changes of those during the period, such as service costs, interest, uh, investment income of the plan, differences between expected and actual experience uh, in uh, determination of liability, et cetera. So you can see there kind of how some of those items uh, affect the net pension liability recorded. Uh, the next four or five slides have the uh, RSI uh, that will be required. The first slide is uh, required supplementary information for single and agent employers. It's being shown using an optional method that combines two different schedules that are required. And one is that last disclosure we just showed for single and agent employers. It's required to be shown uh, for 10 years. Uh, here, the example we have here has just five years so that you can at least read some of the uh, information. So generally, I'm sure it'll probably be a, a two-page disclosure. Um, and in addition to that, at the bottom of the screen, we have some ratios comparing uh, these amounts to covered employee payroll. As I said, this is an optional presentation method. It also, those uh, ratios can be shown separately uh, as a separate schedule from uh, the uh, information that was on the prior uh, slide for the note disclosure. In addition, if an actuarially determined contribution is uh, made for single and agent employers, uh, that actuarially determined contribution and contributions in relation to that amount uh, should be disclosed uh, along with uh, ratios to covered employee payroll as we talked about before. Uh, if an actuarially determined contribution is not made, uh, statutorily or contractually determined contributions should be disclosed in this schedule. Uh, and then the next two slides we have are some of the, the RSI for cost sharing employers. Uh, it's a little bit different. The board determined that uh, all the components as, as they affect the collective net pension liability is not necessary to be shown at each in, for each individual employer. So what we have here is just a, dis, a disclosure for the 10 years of the proportion uh, of the entity. Uh, in this case, it's uh, two-tenths of 1% in the um, most recent year shown on the left. Uh, and then the proportionate share, the dollar amount of the liability being recognized by the cost-sharing employer, and then some of the uh, rate similar ratios as to how that much that amount is to the employer's covered payroll. And at the bottom, it does show the collective uh, total pension liability of the plan as a percentage of the plan's fiduciary net position, uh, so something similar to a funding uh, ratio disclosure. And the last uh, RSI schedule we have is, is a similar to what we showed for single employers. Uh, however, instead of showing the actuarially determined contribution, cost-sharing employers are required to show the contractually required contribution, or in some cases it may be a statutorily required contribution, uh, and their contributions in relation to that covered payroll and related measure. So that's statement 68. I'll move on to statement 73. 
Uh, I won't read the whole title because that will take up most of the rest of my time. Uh, but Statement 73 covers three items, basically. One, uh, counting by employers for pensions that are not provided through trust or not within the scope of Statement 68. Uh, two, accounting for assets uh, held for pensions uh, that are not provided through uh, such trust. Uh, and then three, there's a few uh, amendments to Statement 68 uh, that are required, uh, or I'm sorry, included. Um, as shown on the beginning slides, uh, for employers, the provisions uh, are not effective until fiscal years 2017 or fiscal years beginning after June 15, 2016. Uh, however, the requirements for the amendments to Statement 67 and 68 and the requirements related to assets uh, held for pensions that are not uh, in a trust uh, are effective for fiscal year 2016 statement. Uh, basically, all the accounting by the employer uh, will be the same with the uh, uh, reflecting the fact that there are no assets held in trust. And so therefore, the liability, instead of being the net pension liability, will be the total pension liability. Uh, and therefore, as well, the discount rate will not reflect any expected long-term rate of return. It will be based on the municipal bond rate. Uh, in addition, because the board believes that in these circumstances, the assets are not being set aside in a trust or being funded by the employer uh, on an annual basis towards the trust, that, that RSI schedule I showed you for single and agent employers uh, related to actuarially determined contributions uh, is not going to be required in Statement 73. Uh, now, the accounting for the assets in these circumstances is based on the guidance that's in Statement 43 for OPEB, uh, and that is if the uh, government is holding assets for a multiple employer plan uh, outside of a trust agreement, the government should report those amounts in an agency fund as they relate to other governments. Uh, however, in either a single employer plan or a cost-sharing employer plan, if assets are being held uh, for a pension plan that are not uh, within a trust that meets the criteria, those amounts should be reported by the government itself, that is, in a governmental fund or a proprietary fund. Uh, just quickly, the uh, amendments to Statement 67 and 68 that were made uh, the first notes to required supplementary information about investment-related factors uh, should not include external economic factors. Uh, in addition, the amendments uh, clarify the term separately, finance-specific liabilities, uh, and how that's uh, applied, especially in the determination of uh, employer's proportion in a cost-sharing or a, a special funding situation. Uh, and then finally, revenue recognition guidance. Uh, is specifically uh, given uh, in circumstances in which the non-employer contributing entity uh, is not uh, in a special funding situation. Statement 74, uh, effective for fiscal year 2017. Uh, it covers uh, OPEB that is uh, provided through plans that meet the same criteria we talked about earlier for Statement 68. Uh, and in those circumstances, uh, generally the guidance is the same as for pensions in Statement 67 uh, in the financial statements, disclosures, and RSI. Uh, it also covers uh, OPEB that is uh, our assets held for OPEB that is not provided uh, through trust agreements that meet that criteria. And generally, it provides the same guidance that we just talked about for pensions in Statement 73 uh, related to such assets. And that is, those assets should be reported as government or proprietary fund uh, of the government uh, that's in those uh, types of plans. And if a government is holding uh, such assets in a multiple employer plan, it should report those amounts uh, in an agency fund, the amounts it's holding for other governments. Next, we have Statement 75, uh, Accounting and Financial Reporting for OPEB. 
It's going to supersede Statement 45. Uh, it's effective for fiscal year 2018. Uh, so we've got a few years before it's effective. But because of Statement 45, basically all that uh, measurement and disclosure and RSI information I've been talking about related to pensions will keep uh, going out and talking to people about because the same thing is going to apply to OPEP. Uh, the board, for the most part, took the same approach uh, for measuring and reporting OPEB as it did for pensions. So uh, the projection of the benefits, the discounting, the using entry age uh, to attribute, uh, excuse me, attribute the present value or the present value of projected benefit payments back to uh, periods. Uh, it's all going to be required for OPEB as well. Statement 75. Uh, you know, pulling in the same concepts from Statement 73 for pensions that are not uh, administered through a trust. Statement 75 is going to require when it's not administered through a trust that the discount rate be the muni bond rate, the liability be the total OPEB liability rather than net OPEB liability, uh, et cetera. Uh, at the bottom of the screen there on slide 28, we've got four unique uh, measurement issues related to OPEB. Uh, the first one is new in Statement 75, and it's to include taxes or assessments on benefit payments in the projection. Uh, this is obviously a result of the Affordable Care Act, uh, what's been termed the Cadillac tax that's part of that that goes into effect in 2018. Um, so the board uh, believes that those amounts should be included in the projection of benefit payments. The last three items there on the slide are all carried forward from Statement 45. Uh, that is that the post-employment health care uh, should be based on claims costs uh, or age-adjusted premiums approximating claims costs rather than just flat premium amounts. Uh, and that uh, if there are caps on benefits, uh, that they be, and their cap is determined to be effective, that they be included in the, uh, excuse me, the projection of benefit payments and the alternative measurement method for those uh, OPEP plans with fewer than 100 members uh, was carried forward as well. That'll turn it back over to you, Kenny, to see if there's been any questions so far. All right, Scott, thank you so much. Uh, we are at the first break for Q&A. Let me just refresh everybody. If you want to ask your question, just use the questions tab that's located in the webinar toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen. Just simply type in your question and submit it to us, and we'll take it in the order in which it's received. Scott, thank you so much. We, we did spend a little time on Statement 68 today. Obviously, that's a very important standard for many of the people on the line today, and that's why we wanted to spend quite a bit of time on that. And we want to spend a little time on the questions regarding 68. So let me, let me just start out, uh, please everybody out there, if you have questions on 68, now is your time. You have some, uh, uh, you have the experts on the line with you today, so please ask away. Uh, Scott, let me start out with just a kind of a general question. You know, I know that the board, or at least I've heard that the board is, is getting some questions around covered employee payroll versus pensionable payroll. And uh, some organizations have written in, uh, require or requesting some clarification on that. Can you just briefly talk to us about what the issues are there and what the board might be doing to address those? Yeah, Kenny. Uh, generally, that issue um, is, is related to Statement 67 in the fact that uh, the definition for both Statement 67 and 68 for covered payroll uh, has changed from Statements 25 and 27. Uh, under Statements 25 and 27, it, it the definition is more, as, as you termed, uh, pensionable payroll was what was required to be shown in the required supplementary information. Uh, and under Statements 67 and 68, uh, the board determined that should be total, uh, generally total payroll. And so where the issue comes into play is, uh, in some circumstances, the pension plans uh, have not been collecting that total payroll number they've only been collecting the pensionable payroll number. And so pension plans generally have difficulty uh, 
coming up with that number to show in the required supplementary information. And so the board uh, is going to look at a project prospectus uh, potentially next month to determine whether to uh, see if they want to uh, uh, re-examine that issue and provide potentially some relief uh, in those circumstances. All right. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Kenny, Very good. This, yeah. Kenny, Go ahead, that, uh, just jump in. Um, you know, this was an issue that uh, was included in the exposure draft, but given, you know, uh, the fact that, you know, we were looking at new calculations associated with pensions, we were talking about, you know, the proposal was to bring the liability on the face of the financial statements and the attribution for the cost sharing. You know, those are all major issues, and I think this one just somewhat kind of slipped under the radar uh, for many of the respondents. Yeah. So we, so when we got the responses back uh, to the exposure draft, uh, there wasn't uh, there wasn't any negative feedback. So the board went forward, and and plus it was aligning the measure with what we had previously with uh, other post-employment benefits. But you know, as people began to implement, uh, and we, of course. Uh, I think probably the, the biggest thing that triggered it was a, a Q&A uh, in the 68 implementation guide. Uh, you know, suddenly people became aware of this is a different number, uh, certainly a number that can be calculated by the employer, uh, but more difficult uh, for the plan. So I think one of the issues that the board is, is going to be considered is should this just be a modification for the plan who may not have any access to the information, or should it also be uh, a change for the uh, for the employer. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Scott. I, I, I agree, Dave. I think that was one issue that kind of slipped under the radar screen until we had the Q and A. Listen, we have four questions I think from the audience so far. Let's let's try to get through these and then we'll uh, we'll move ahead. The first one uh, is like this: for for schedule of contributions where required as RSI. Do the contributions have to be from the current period or from the prior period if our measurement date is one year prior to the current period? Okay. Um, I'm going to answer this twofold just to make sure we're on the same page. The first is if it's a single employer and we're doing the first RSI schedule I showed where we're determining the uh, or showing the effects of the changes in the net pension liability, it's obviously during the period in which the uh, net pension liability is being measured. Um, however, uh, I think the questions in relation to the schedule that uh, has been put up on the screen right now, and that is uh, the actuarially uh, determined contributions, and that is in relation to the fiscal year of the employer. Uh, and so that may be uh, taking into account two different plan years uh, or multiple plan two plan years in which different actually determined contributions were uh, made. And so some, you know, if it's the plans of December 31st and the state is of June 30th, you're going to have to look at the contributions that were made uh, for the last half, the last, the last plan year, the first half of the current uh, plan year, or, as I said, during the fiscal year of the state itself. All right. Thanks, Scott. Let, let's look at the next one. Uh, and this one does pertain to a cost sharing plan. And the question is, if there is a net pension asset rather than a net pension liability, what is the appropriate offset in the net position in the government-wide or proprietary fund financial statements? Would something like restricted for pensions work, or is there a better way or a more appropriate classification? Well, um, I yeah. Yes, it would work. You generally wouldn't think about it in that manner. But uh, um, if if there is a net pension liability, or I'm sorry, net pension asset, uh, regardless of whether it's a single employer or a cost sharing employer, uh, it would just be an asset that you know has been contributed to a pension plan that is you know meets the criteria, so it's irrevocable, et cetera, so it would be restricted for those pension benefits. Yeah, right. yeah. I think we would all agree that the restricted would be appropriate classification. All right, very good. Next question, uh, pretty interesting. Can you please clarify how the standards affect measurement and reporting for institutions that have employees on the federal employees retirement system? 
land-grant colleges and universities will likely have this. We, I presume we being the state, pay for the benefits, but it's not our plan. It seems like we are a cost-sharing employer, but the federal systems will have no data for us. Yeah, um, statement 67, or I should say statement 68, does not uh, provide any relief to determine, uh, or I should say, if the information is not available. I mean, the statement 68 as written would require the government to still determine the liability. Uh, however, similar to as we talked about a few minutes ago, Kenny, uh, on your first question, uh, the board is considering uh, next month a, a project prospectus related to these circumstances. Uh, we've heard about them in the university uh, arena for the federal program. We've also heard about them <clears throat> in relation to union plans or Taft-Hartley plans uh, as well, uh, in which the employer is contributing to uh, pension plan, however the uh, pension plan itself is not subject to GASB standards uh, and is not uh, making these types of calculations. Yeah, again this, uh, you know, as, as we deliberated Statement 68, the, you know, the issue really I mean, it didn't come to light. It, it became, it, you know, we, we started getting some feedback after 68 was issued, but up until just recently, uh, most of the situations that we ran across, um, we were talking about a handful of employees, and you know, in other words, it would be clearly immaterial mm -hmm. to the uh, to the financial uh, statements. Uh, however, uh, more recently, some of the plans have come to light where it could have a, a material effect. I, we're we're still looking at the college universities to see if 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 that rises to that level or not. Uh, but uh, with some um, uh, government uh, ports, for example, where they have uh, members, uh, you know, dock workers who are in plans uh, mm -hmm. that uh, are subject to Taft-Hartley. Uh, you know, it, it could be material in that in that case. So the board, that is why the board is going to be looking at adding a project um, actually less than two weeks uh, from now. And if the uh, if the project is added to the agenda, uh, the the goal is to uh, to try to get an exposure draft on the streets uh, by November, and a and a final standard out by March, um, recognizing that you know that's you know that's that that of course for those of you who follow Gatsby that's lightning speed, uh, but yet uh, you know it it still may cause some issues. Uh, you know, for those who have June 30th year end. So if, if uh, anyone is aware of uh, a situation with a land grant school where you're talking about a potentially material amount to the financial statements, if you could contact Emily Clark of our staff, uh, it would be greatly appreciated because the, the more information we have about uh, specific facts and circumstances, the better. Very good, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions we do have from the audience. I, I, would, I would like to pose one more um, because I know we have a lot of auditors on the line today in the audience. And as you all demonstrated uh, with the sensitivity analysis for the footnote regarding the discount rate, discount rate makes a big, big difference. As an auditor, uh, and, I, and I realize you guys promulgate accounting standards and principles, not audit standards, but do you have any thoughts on what the auditor's role, what should the auditor be looking for uh, in terms of reasonableness of that discount rate? Because it can make such a big difference. Uh, any any suggestions or any thoughts along those lines? Well, I mean, it is it is an expected rate of return. I, I uh, sometimes we somewhat uh, kiddingly say it's it, it's not a wishful rate of return, uh, and there are. There are some governments that, uh, you know, when you look at their uh, expected rate of return or, or the amount they're using, I should say, the discount, uh, you know, they're in the, the 9% uh, realm. And, but yet if, you know, that's one of the items that Scott uh, alluded to earlier as far as the breakdown of the expected return for each major class of asset. And because of that, you know, if you're, if, if, you know, again, we're you know we're not auditors here. We uh, a number of us, matter of fact, every one of us here in the room today, 
has been an auditor in the past, so it's really easy to try to slip on the auditor's hat, but uh, we want to make it very clear that we're not auditors, and, and of course this is, uh, you know, subject to um, uh, professional judgment, but uh, uh, certainly a red flag would be raised if you look at those expected uh, returns, and those are real rated returns, and then you add in an inflation factor and it doesn't uh, come close to what is being used as a discount rate, uh, uh, it would, I think it would uh, at least cause some people to have a discussion about it. Uh, but it should, you know, in the past, I, I believe that people just looked at the expected rate of return, they said, okay, we're, you know, it uh, was accepted by the actuary, we're relying on, on an, the actuaries as experts, and we move forward with the new auditing standards, as you know, Kenny, uh, the, you know, things have changed. Sure have. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate that uh, that insight. I just wanted to pose that question because I know we have a lot of auditors out there today. Uh, I think uh, we probably should proceed and move ahead in the interest of time that we have uh, gotten through all the questions from the audience. I just remind the audience you can submit your questions at any time. So if one comes to you as we're moving through this next section uh, on 68, you go ahead and type it in and send it to us and Perhaps at the end of the uh, webinar, we'll have time to get to it. So with that, let's uh, let's move ahead. I think, Ken Sherman, are you up next? That's right, Kenny. We're going to talk about Statement 69 on government combinations and disposals. Uh, statement 69 replaced the old guidance that was applicable to state and local governments, which derived from pre-1989 guidance from the AICPA's Accounting Principles uh, Board, Opinion 16, 17, and 30 which the board uh, excluded from the codification of the pre-89 FASB AICPA standard in Statement 62 because it, it, it was really more appropriate and, and, and we could do a, a more comprehensive job in a separate statement, which is what Statement 69 does. There's not going to be a whole lot of combination activity at the state government level. Uh, you're not going to find states merging or one state acquiring the, uh, another one, but I think there's a lot of people listening today that have a local government oversight responsibility or do some local government auditing. So the information on, on uh, combinations is, is going to be relevant to those folks. And you do have some disposal activity uh, at, at the state level when you've got some spin-offs or transfers of operations. So, I'm going to quickly run through the the, uh, the basics of Statement 69, and we're going to cover uh, the things you see on the screen now. Uh, combinations in which no significant consideration is provided, and we needed to put significant qualifier in there to to uh, address the situations that in sometimes statute requires some consideration for a transfer of title, uh, and you'll find something in exchange for a dollar. Well, that's not really an acquisition. Uh, we consider that to be no consideration provided. And that covers government mergers, which is a, a combination involving an entire government or entire governments. You, see, you find that often in consolidated school district arrangements and, and from time to time with city-county consolidations and village boroughs and, 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 and townships town at that sort of level. Transfer of operations is like a merger, except it involves less than the entire government, includes uh, shared service arrangements, spin-offs of operations, uh, and the like. So that's the, that's the merger and transfer aspect of Statement 69. Also deals with combinations in which there is significant consideration provided. And more often than not, you see these transactions take place in the business type activity arena, uh, largely with the health care and housing. Uh, sometimes perhaps uh, higher education, uh, and at the local level, uh, often with, with the tribal governments. And when there is significant consideration provided, we are talking about uh, government acquisitions. Uh, on the other side of the coin, when you've got a merger, you've got a transfer of operations on the receiving end, uh, there's some accounting necessary on the disposal end. So we also have some provisions in Statement 69 about how to account for the disposal of the operation that's being spun off or shared or merged with another government. So let's begin with the uh, mergers and transfers, that is, when no significant consideration is exchanged. The assets and liabilities that are moved from one government to the next are carried over at carrying value. If you're familiar with APB 16, uh, this was what was known in that literature as the pooling of interests. Uh, and when we talk about carrying values, there is a presumption 
that the value uh, reported by the merging government was uh, done in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. If not, you have to make those adjustments so that it is uh, in, in, the, in the combination adjustment. Uh, we're looking at mergers. Uh, again, no uh, significant uh, consideration exchanged. Uh, in a merger, uh, one or more existing governments cease to exist and become a single government. You can have mergers that create a new government. Uh, you can have a merger that creates a larger government. In other words, a new entity uh, begins and the carrying values are established at the date of the merger. There is no prior period because the government didn't exist prior to the merger. Uh, if the merger uh, represents a, a, an embellishment or enhancement or enlargement of a continuing entity, the carrying values are those that were at the beginning of the reporting period. So when you report that, uh, that, that year's financial statements, you would restate beginning uh, uh, net position uh, so that it looks as if the transaction had occurred at the beginning of the year, similar to what you do for a change in the reporting entity. For a transfer of operations, which again is like a merger but deals with less than the entire entity, uh, that carrying value is established at the date of the transfer and it's recognized as a transaction in the financial statements of the ultimate uh, uh, merged government. From time to time, you may have to or may choose to make some adjustments to those carrying values. Uh, for example, if there are divergent accounting principles, policies, and estimates uh, among the merging governments, the government can choose to make some adjustments to the carrying values so that the uh, principles, policies, and estimates are consistent across the board. Uh, if there is a situation in which capital assets that are being carried over would be impaired from the perspective of the new government, uh, the government would be required to recognize that impairment according to the provisions of Statement 42 in, in recognizing the, the merged activities. Uh, and if you've got a, a merger that results in a continuing entity, and remember I said you restate the beginning uh, fund balance uh, net position as if that would have occurred at the beginning of the year. If it did occur late in the year, you may have some transactions between the merging governments that, that you'd have to deal with a, a potential reclassification or uh, elimination in, in the uh, operating statements. All right, on the other side of the coin, how should an acquisition be reported? And again, this is when there is significant consideration exchange. And, and just as a, as a word of caution, as, as we look at these requirements, we're not talking about a transaction in which a government acquires a legally separate organization that remains legally separate from the acquiring entity. If that's the case, you're, you're dealing with the requirements and the provisions of Statement 14 as amended because as it remains legally separate, it would be a component unit rather than part of the acquiring government. So in this case, assets and liabilities would be recognized at acquisition value. Uh, conceptually, acquisition value means basically replacement cost for the assets, uh, a settlement amount for the liabilities acquired. Uh, so the acquisition value measurements, uh, assets would be the, the cost to acquire a similar asset with a similar service capacity. And on the liability side, the amount that would be paid to, to offload the debt. Uh, that's not to say that to, to liquidate the debt, but what would you have to pay someone to take it off your hands? Uh, there are some exceptions to acquisition value, quite a few actually, mainly on the liability side, and there are exceptions because the GASB already has standards for those measurements, pension and obligation uh, require obligations, uh, OPEB obligations, uh, uh, pollution remediation liabilities, landfill closure and post-closure uh, care costs, uh, special terminations, uh, and another uh, wrinkle would be if there are any deferred inflows or outflows of resources, rather than trying to figure out what acquisition value might be, they would be brought in at carrying value. And of course, any investments uh, subject to the fair value requirements of Statement 31 would be uh, accounted for and recognized at fair value. Often going to be true that there's going to be a difference between the consideration paid and the net resources uh, acquired, whether that's a net asset or a net liability. If the consideration exceeds the net value, you've got a deferred outflow of resources, what we used to call goodwill. Uh, in, in the old days, under the old standards, it's a deferred outflow of resources rather than an asset, but it's still on that side of the balance sheet. Uh, if the uh, accounting goes the other way, that is, if the net assets, the net position acquired 
exceeds the uh, consideration given, Statement 69 would say that you would first consider reducing the carrying value or the acquisition value of the non-current, non-financial assets, that is primarily the capital assets, but you need to take a closer look at the transaction because if the transaction was structured in a way to provide some economic relief to the uh, uh, acquired entity uh, and it's a bit of a bargain purchase, then you can recognize the contribution in the operating statement to recognize that. And even a little deeper analysis might reveal that it looks like a bargain, but it really wasn't because the entity that you've acquired has some, some liabilities or potential contingencies that weren't recognized in the financial statement and the additional consideration paid might very well cover the, the possibilities that those liabilities are going to eventuate. So in that case, you would also consider a recognition of a contribution in the operating statement rather than reducing the value uh, of the uh, uh, capital asset. So what about the disposal aspect of a government combination? How should disposals of government operations be reported? Uh, the government w uh, that, that is uh, uh, disposing a, a, of the net assets would report a gain or a loss uh, for all disposals of operations, whether that was a transfer or a sale. Of course, the gain would be you've disposed of a net liability. Uh, a loss would be the disposal of net assets. And gains and losses, gains or losses, would be are required to be recognized as special items in the operating statement or statement of activities. Uh, and, and remember, the disposals can cover uh, the disposal of an operation, a spin-off that creates a new government. It can be a, an operation that's spun off or, or shared or merged with an existing government. It could cover the disposition of an operation that's sold uh, to a government or non-governmental entity, and there's a gain or loss recognized there. Or it can even uh, uh, cover an operation uh, that's been abandoned in which the government simply walks away and says, we're not going to be in this business any longer. You've got costs associated with that disposal. It should consider all the costs incurred during the period that were associated with the disposal of operations. And it would be a period cost rather than capitalized at some asset that's going to be amortized over a future period. And that would be included in that special item gain or loss. Uh, if you've got uh, some, some termination costs in anticipation of that event in prior periods, you, you're not required to defer and, and, and recognize those as some kind of prepaid expenses uh, looking forward to, to a uh, uh, disposal. And finally, as I'm sure you are aware, uh, there's going to be some disclosure requirements uh, with the uh, combinations and disposals. And very quickly, without getting into all the details, because this is really the kind of stuff that you would say, well, this is intuitive. This is the kind of stuff that users need to know. Description of the combination, the date it occurred, the primary reasons why it was encountered. And that is, is, is true for all combinations, whether it was a merger or an acquisition. Uh, the items you see pertinent to mergers and transfers, you're talking about the amount, amounts recognized, and that is the carrying values brought over, and the significant adjustments uh, to those carrying values. And we talked about why you might make those adjustments on an earlier slide, for example, impairments of the capital assets. Combina our, uh, disclosures for acquisitions, uh, you're going to disclose the consideration provided, the net position acquired. But there is no requirement to reconcile what was the carrying value of the assets and liabilities to what you've recognized as the acquisition value. Uh, you need to make some uh, disclosure of, of contingent consideration, if there is any, uh, which doesn't occur very often in the government environment. But if you've got that deal, uh, you're going to make some disclosures about that. Uh, on the disposal piece uh, of Statement 69, disclosure-wise, uh, you need to disclose the financial statement information that's from the operating statement. In other words, we've, we've disposed of this operation and what are the historical uh, revenues and expenditures or expenses that, uh, that are uh, pertinent to that operation. So uh, that uh, takes me to the end of the uh, Statement 69 uh, review. And I'm going to turn the uh, speaker over to Jalan, and she's going to talk about their value. All right. Thank you, Ken. Um, hello, everyone. So today we are going to go through the newly issued uh, Statement 72 on fair value measurement and application. As you may have noticed, 
we have only 10 slides here at this presentation. So um, we are not going to be able to cover everything in statement 72, but hopefully it's the breakdown of what this statement is really talking about will encourage you to go to gatsby.org to download a free copy of statement 72 and will encourage you to really use it as a tool to help you with your work. So for those of you in the audience who are familiar with the FANSI's uh, ASC topic 820 on fair value, uh, the good news for you is that it's going to be an easy read for you because most of the general and measurement principles are nearly identical with a few um, exceptions. And this statement also really strives to enhance um, the um, readability and make a lot of the things more relevant in a governmental environment. And for those of you who are not quite familiar with the FASI's uh, topic 820, again, I just want to emphasize that hopefully you can find today's presentation will help you to understand the statement and really go read it and use it as a tool for you. So with that said, Let's look at the um, overview of uh, Statement 72. Um, this is about, of course, what this statement is about and why we issue that and, and when the effective date is. And you may have already know that in the past, a, um, the guidance on fair value, either on the measurement or on the application, is primarily in Statement 31. And it's also, uh, you can also find it is scattered in other statements such as um, statement 53 or in some of the old pension standards in statement 25 or 27. And also the fair value used to be called different names as market value or fair market value or fair value. So there are a lot of inconsistencies in the, the definition, in this, um, the application or the, or the disclosure. And statement 72 was issued on February 27th of this year. And this, the goal of this statement is really to improve the consistency and comparability in tell the government how they should measure, apply the fair value, and how they should disclose information about this fair value measurement. And you notice that it's effective as of today. Um, if for those of you who have June 30th, 2015 year end. Now, I call this slide roadmap. The reason is that, was, like I said earlier, I want to just break down what this statement is really about and so you not really think this is something that, you know, a mind-boggling statement there. So there are 86 paragraphs in the text of standards section, and including paragraph 86, which is the glossary for this statement. And the first section, which is the first 63 paragraphs, um, talks about the general principle, the measurement principle, and very important definitions and concepts um, in a statement. And then you look at the second section, the starting from paragraph 64, it's really about application and disclosure. And this second section really would be to answer your question, how does this statement affect me? And so, and but you know, the first and second section of the Texas standard uh, didn't really, it's not the all about the statement 72. Uh, in fact, the appendices after the text standard section has a lot of useful information that you might find helpful for your understanding of the statement. For example, Appendix B, a basis for conclusions, and it tells you a lot of these um, factors that goes into the board's determination of whether, why, some of the alternatives were considered, but eventually were rejected, and give you some examples of how you can understand the actual text standard. And the most importantly, in my opinion, is Appendix C. They have, there are five illustrations of examples of certain applications for some of those really important and key concepts. For example, there's an uh, example of application of unit of account, Example of level two and level three inputs. Example of application of the definition of investment 
and the two examples for disclosures that's going to be covered or required by Statement 72. Um, so now let's jump into the first section of this statement. So first, of course, the most important concept is the definition of fair value. A fair value is a price that would be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer a liability in an orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date. So an important concept here is fair value is an exit price. This is important because later on I will cover something in the application side that's very different or almost opposite to this exit price concept. Exit price means it's something you wanted to get rid of, the price you pay to sell the asset, price and you are going to pay to, to, to transfer a liability. So that's what the exit price means. And again, how, uh, and then you look at something as the unit of account. This is a fairly new concept that's being introduced by this statement. So what is a unit of account? That is the level at which an asset or liability is aggregated or disaggregated for measurement, recognition, or disclosure purposes. And how do you apply this concept of unit of account? I'm, go I'm going to refer you again to the Appendix C in Illustration 1. It gives you the examples that how you can apply the unit of account. And so um, moving forward, we look at some other really important um, measurement principles. So the first one is the valuation techniques and approaches. So there are, under the fair value principle, you would have to, or you're required, to use one of the three valuation approaches and using the valuation techniques that are consistent with one of those three valuation approaches to um, do your fair value measurement. And so what is a market approach? Well, the most um, commonly seen example is a quoted market price um, of a stock. Um, you use that quoted market price of that, um, and that is consistent with the market approach. And what is a cost approach? That means how much it's going to cost you today to replace the present service capacity of an asset. Basically, how are you going to how how much is going to cost you if you are going to construct or acquire an asset with a comparable present service capacity? And what is the income approach? Income approach means that it's going to convert future amounts, such as future cash flows, to a single current amount. For example, a discounted present value of future cash flows. And that may be used to measure the fair value of investment, for example, a uh, commercial real estate investment. And now we look at the fair value hierarchy. What is a hierarchy? The fair value hierarchy really differentiates or categorizes the um, three levels of inputs um, based on the observability of the inputs. And what are inputs? Inputs are basically just information that you as a government will need to collect about an asset or a liability that you're going to measure the fair value. And the, the hierarchy, like I said, categorize the inputs um, into the three different levels, levels one, two, and three, based on their observability. So level one would be the, the most observable ones. Um, the example, like I said earlier, would be a, a quoted market price of a stock. And you can get it from your brokerage account or dealer's market or things like that. And what is the... Uh, example of level two. Level two would be, um, you can find some other examples of the application or actually the uh, level two inputs in the second illustration of Appendix C. But for example, if a bond is valued using the matrix pricing by a pricing service, then the price or a yield, the yield of the similar bond 
would be an example of the um, level two inputs. And what is level three? Level three is an unobservable input. What that means is you cannot go out in a market to, to find that. And because, for example, if you wanted to measure a commercial real estate and you do not really have the market data, you can only use some assumptions and use the income approach, one of the measurement approach, and look at the financial forecast of the future cash flows on the revenues and expenses, and then come up with a present value, a discounted present value of those future cash flows, and use that as the fair value measurement of that commercial real estate investment. Again, there are examples of different types of level three inputs in Appendix C, illustration number three. Um, the one thing that's very important is because we have this hierarchy and so the measurement principle tells you that when you measure fair value, you should maximize the use of observable inputs and minimize the use of unobservable inputs. What does that mean is that if you can go out, you can find a level three input for that investment, you should use it unless you can find the one that is observable, then you shouldn't go directly to level three. That's what it means, maximize the use of observable inputs. Now we look at the um, actual problem you're most interested in. How does that affect me? How does this statement affect me? So the application of fair value measurement, the first thing is that under statement 72, investments generally should be measured at fair value. And what is the definition of investment? The definition of investment has two components to it. And both of these components must be met in order for an asset to be classified as an investment. And the first component is that a government that holds this asset it would would be holding that asset primarily for the purpose of income or profit. And the second component is that this asset would have the present service capacity based solely on its ability to generate cash or to be sold to generate cash. And these concepts are very important because, for example, we said the purpose are primarily for income and profit. So if you have a pension plan, and the pension plan is holding an income-producing commercial property, then that suggests that income-producing, the income and profit, would be its primary purpose of this asset. So one of the criteria component of the definition of investment is met. And you look at some other, the other component also, is important is that the present service capacity of this asset has to be based solely on this asset's ability to generate cash or to be sold to generate cash. An example, let me give you, is that a housing financing agency might hold some mortgage loan receivables, and the loans are part of the government pro program to help the first-time home buyers and to encourage the home ownership in that community. So the present service capacity of that loan receivable is to provide a service to allow the qualified resident to buy their first home. And so that present service capacity is not based solely on the loan receivable's ability to generate cash or to bestow to generate cash. And therefore, that loan receivable does not meet the definition of an investment. To really understand what the two components of the definition of investment plays, again, you can turn into Appendix C, illustration four, that are, there are six examples of how you can apply the definition of an investment. Now, another important point here, if you look at the fourth bulletin point on this slide that says the purpose is determined at acquisition. What it means is that when you acquire an asset, 
you are going to use the definition of investment in Statement 72 to determine whether this asset meets the definition of an investment or not. And once you make that determination, you do not reclassify that asset, no matter how you're going to change that usage of the asset later on. So that, that means, for example, if you acquire a building and you are using that building for your normal operations, and at the acquisition, you determined that building does not meet the definition of investment, so it is a capital asset to you. And later on, you decided that you no longer need that building for operation. You're going to let the building be idle. And then later on, you decided that you're going to sell that building for some money there. Are you going to re reclassify the building? The answer is no. Because according to Simmons 72, the purpose for that building is determined at acquisition. And you do not reclassify it once that determination is made at acquisition. So remember that important point there. And this slide listed the investments that are exempted from being reported as fair value. Um, these are the items that are exempted from fair value reporting before Simmons 72 was issued. And they're just going to be continued to be exempted from being reported at fair value. And you can find the entire list of that at paragraph 69 of the statement. Now we look at something that might not be very familiar but to some of the folks out there. It's a net asset value per share. What this is is that the government is permitted to use net asset per share or its equivalent um, such as ownership interest in a partner's capital as a practical expedient to establish the fair value of an investment in a non-governmental entity that does not have readily determinable fair value. It sounds very long, I know. Um, well, really, it's just some of the examples that hedge fund investment, venture capital investment, private equity funds, and some of the the investment you usually call alternative investment, that you cannot find the observable input. You cannot find something that you can get it from the market. Then you have to use some of the other measurement approach and measurement and, and valuation technique to establish its fair value. And these ones are you can use. This is a, this is the, that um, to provide you with a tool. Um, the net asset value per share. And examples of such uh, alternative investments, you can find it in the um, example for the disclosure in Appendix C. The second example of the uh, pension plan's uh, investment disclosure that gives you a lot of uh, detailed disclosure as to how you should disclose um, or what kind of um, investment that are measured using the net asset value per share. But the, uh, the good news for the, is that if an investment uh, fair value is determined using the net asset value per share, then the government is not required to categorize the input into the level one, two, or three. And you can see that example in the appendix C. Um, another part of the application is that from now on, Understanding 72, some assets are no longer going to be valued at fair value. Instead, they're going to be valued at acquisition value. And like I said earlier, this is opposite to an exit price. This is an entry price concept, meaning how much you have to pay to acquire an asset. So you can see those um, the three types of uh, assets that are listed on the slide. And also need to remember that use of acquisition value should be applied prospectively. And now the last but not the least of the statement on the disclosure requirement. There are only three paragraphs, the paragraphs that are talking about disclosure. Paragraph 80, 81, and 82. But 
these slides, this slide here tells you some of the highlights what you are required as a government to, to disclose for your fair value measurement. But I would encourage you to really look at paragraph 80 there because that paragraph tells you all the factors you should consider when you determine the level of detail and level of disaggregation and how much emphasis you should place on each disclosure requirement there. And again, that you can look at the two examples, one of a city government, general purpose government that has fairly simple investment, and another one, uh, a pension plan who had a more sophisticated in investment to see how they disclose um, the fair value measurement under statement 72. Uh, so with that, we'll conclude the presentation on um, statement 72. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn to Ken uh, for statement 76. <clears throat> I know everyone's excited about the new GAAP hierarchy, so we're going to take a couple of minutes to review the provisions of uh, statement 76, which was released uh, last month. Uh, the, the board has simplified and compacted, if you will, what used to be four categories of, of uh, authoritative GAAP down to two, which you see on the screen now, the GASB statements, which is the highest level A under the authoritative umbrella. Uh, and remember, that's the GASB statements that are also regularly incorporated into the codification, so the original pronouncements and the codification have equal footing as, as level A GAAP. Uh, and, and, of course, those pronouncements are, are the uh, focus of, of the uh, AICPA Code of Professional Conduct, we used to call Rule 203. The second category under authoritative is Category B, which includes such things as GASB technical bulletins, the implementation guide, the comprehensive guide, the Q&As that you're all familiar with and have, have, have a, a high opinion of. That was probably the biggest change from the old hierarchy to the new one is the elevation of the implementation guides from what used to be Level D to now level B, uh, and, and the third item in level B is the uh, AICPA literature that is uh, specifically cleared by the, by the GASB. And, and then below authoritative, of course, is the non-authoritative non uh, sources, which we're going to look at in a minute on a separate slide. The categories A and B, uh, the characteristics of those two levels are what you see on the board now. The major difference is the level at which the board is involved with the issuance for a category A, that is the statements uh, from the JSB. They are formally approved, voted on by the board for their issuance for the purpose of creating, amending, superseding, or interpreting standards. And let me focus on interpreting for a second because under the new hierarchy, uh, the board has decided that we would no longer issue interpretations but any guidance that we would otherwise have put in an interpretation would instead be uh, uh, issued in, in the uh, uh, format of, of a statement. And of course, there is the exposure uh, period for public comment, which uh, uh, is a requirement for the authoritative guidance. Category B, uh, slightly different, although it may seem subtle. Uh, when it's cleared by the board, that means that the board does not object to the, to the uh, guidance issuance. Uh, it's made specifically applicable to state and local governments, and that, of course, applies to anything that the AICPA uh, would, uh, would devise rather than the implementation guide because they would obviously be applicable to state and local governmental entities and exposed for a period of public comment. Let's take a look for a second at the Comprehensive Implementation Guide. You're all familiar with that. We've been putting these guides out, I think, since about 2003. Uh, and this, of course, is the big Q&A. Uh, and the, just to kind of make a long story short here, the reason or, or the ability to elevate the, the applicability or its position in the hierarchy from level D to level B required us to expose the entire document for public comment, which we did, and you might remember it was out for exposure for the period of a year, uh, last calendar year. Uh, and the second half of the slide there tells you what we did in preparing that document for public exposure. Uh, we, we cleaned up some Q&As, we moved illustrations to a non-authoritative appendix, and after all the dust clears on the uh, comment letters and the other due process uh, motions, that will all be elevated to level B authoritative guidance. So here's your list of non-authoritative GAP. Uh, I'm not going to read these for you, but it's, the concept statements is on the top. That doesn't mean that that's where you have to look, but it's there because 
any source of non-authoritative gap should be consistent with the concepts in the GASB's conceptual framework. And the other item I want to point out is the underlined one there, which is practices that are widely recognized and prevalent in state and local government. That's dropped down from what used to be level, I think it was level D, in the, in the old hierarchy is now a non-authoritative gap. And, and, and one of the major uh, advantages to doing that is there were instances in which there was guidance in the implementation guide, and there was a different application that some would argue was prevalent practice, and the you, you pretty much had the option of going one way or the other. So what this will do will say that if we've dealt with something in the implementation guide, and it looks like prevalent practice goes divergent to that, uh, that you're going to be obligated to follow what's in the implementation guide. I know I covered that very quickly, uh, but I think we want to move on to a, 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 a overview of, of what else is on the GASB's agenda. And uh, Dave is going to cover that. But we're going to put that question screen up again to see if there's been any questions for Jalan or I on the uh, uh, areas that we've covered. Ken and Jalan, thank you so much. We, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, let me just try to get through these real quick, and then we'll move on to Dave. First of all, uh, Ken or Jalan, both of you maybe, uh, will Statement 69 change as a result of Statement 72? Anything in uh, combinations and uh, in 69 that will change as a result of the new fair value statement in 72? Now, Kenny, uh, 72 kind of picked up the notion of acquisition value from 69, so that, you know that's kind of built in consistency right there. But the answer is no, I don't think anything is going to change in 69 from, from the right. provisions in 72. Sounds good. Thank you, Ken. Uh, again, for uh, Jalan, this is uh, 72. If a valuation results in a level 2 and 3 classification, I understand that the lower level, that is level 3, would be used to classify the investment if the level 3 input is significant. Can you please elaborate on how to determine significant? It's really a professional judgment. We don't define what is significant in a standard. Um, you have to really look at the facts and circumstances on if that level three really dominates, you know, um, or or really play a majority role on on the role on the determination of it. Yeah, normally we use the term significant as a uh, kind of a code word for materiality, but in this case, you know, it is more of a uh, a qualitative. You yeah. know, if you're looking at materiality, it's not quantitative, but it's more of a qualitative measure. You know, again, what you know, in in looking at the entire uh, determination of, of fair value, how much did you rely on the, the, the level three inputs versus the level two in, in, in making the determination the amount? Uh, but there's no, you know, we'd like to say, well, if it's uh, more than 50% or something like that, but uh, there really isn't a, uh, uh, you know, when you talk about, you know, a lot of people, when you apply standards, they were talking about significant, people were coming out and saying, well, substantial, which is higher than significant, is maybe only 20%. So uh, that gives you an idea of potentially how you could apply uh, significance in that situation. But again, the bottom line is professional judgment. Yeah, yeah very good. Thank you, guys. One last question on uh, 72. If a government entity has investments in private equity funds, not publicly traded, but the underlying investments in the fund are publicly traded securities, is this investment considered a level one or level three security? You, you have investment in private equity funds. It doesn't matter the underlying assets are. If your investment is private equity funds, then it's most likely a level three, I would say. And and, and that, like I said, you that's where, because that gives you, um, emphasize on what is the unit of account when you look at the private equity fund. The unit of account is your membership unit or your shares in that private equity, private equity fund, which usually might be organized as a limited partnership. So you're not really looking at the underlying asset in the partnership. You're looking at your share in a private equity fund. So it's really a level three instead of level one. All right. Thank you, Jalan. All right. Let's, uh, let's move ahead. Uh, we're going to discuss some, uh, some uh, other, uh, other activities and projects that are going on at the GASB. Dave Bean's going to cover this. We're going to hand the baton off to the anchor leg 
Uh, Dave, you've got five <laughs> minutes and about 37 slides, so I know you're fast, but I'm not sure you're this fast. <laughs> Kenny, Kenny, I am I am not that fast, so I'm going to focus on uh, the, the the last uh, uh, two slides, slides 52 and 53. Uh, but just to kind of step back for a second, and and actually, there's there's no way I'm going to get through 11 projects in five minutes. But uh, I just wanted to kind of give you a, a view. If you know, for those of you who keep track of things, will uh, notice that uh, you know this is the year of the standard. Last year was the year of the due process document. This is the year of the standard, and actually next year will be the year of the standard. Uh, we have um, seven standards uh, scheduled to be uh, uh, to be issued uh, this year. And the board, as Ken mentioned, the board also approved um, the the new implementation guide uh, 2015-1, which is currently in production. The board did clear that for issuance. Uh, before the end of June, and you know, I refer to that one as the Burger King of documents because it is a whopper by any you know anybody's definition. It's it's massive. Um, so when we look at the effective dates that both you and, and Dave covered, you know, if you kind of want to slot in things based on um, the exposure draft that were released uh, at the end of this month. You know, you're you're looking at uh, the blending requirements uh, going into effect in 2017. You're looking at the split interest agreements going into 2018. And as you look at this list on page 52, um, you know that leaves three documents: uh, uh, leases, fiduciary responsibilities, and, and and the asset retirement obligation. And and the board will, as, as Dave mentioned earlier, the board will very carefully consider when the effective dates of those pronouncements are going to be, uh, because it's uh, so key. We've, you know, we've effectively got major standards lined up right through 2018. So, so likely the effective dates for at least a couple of those, particularly leases and fiduciary responsibilities, will be after uh, 2018. But again, the board has not deliberated it. We haven't come to any, uh, you know, final recommendation at a staff level. But, uh, uh, you know, just, you know, when you start seeing seven this year, six next year, I guess the one thing I would, uh, you know, ask you to think about is in the 31 years of the existence of GASB, uh, it, it still only works out to 2.5 uh, standards a year. So. Uh, we were kind of making up for last year's no standards with a, a, a quite a few this year and quite a few next year. But again, looking at it, uh, particularly on the project level with leases and responsibilities, those are the big, you know, ticket items. Uh, but uh, we still have some very important um, projects in in front of us. Uh, just quickly, tax abatements. Um, the key disclosure there, and it is a disclosure uh, document, but for states, uh, you know, other than describing the programs, uh, it's going to be reporting the gross dollar amount of the tax abatements uh, on an accrual basis during the year. That's going to be the major disclosure requirement there. External investment pools, a lot of changes. Um, over the last few years, we uh, used to have many more what we would call 2A7-like pools. Uh, but I think uh, as the uh, spotlight turned on those pools, uh, many of them discovered they were 2A7 kind of like. And so they moved off of the application of the Statement uh, uh, 31 uh, provisions and, uh, and went to fair value. With this proposal that's just hit the street, uh, I think that a, a number of pools will be reevaluating and, and and making a, a new decision because this is a, you know, kind of like uh, we saw with with fair value. This is a one-time decision. If somebody has been on fair value, they will have one year in which to make a decision of whether they want to go to a an all amortized cost valuation or whether they will uh, retain a fair value uh, measurement uh, for their investments. Um, the leases project, uh, we the board is working on an exposure draft, um, should be out by the end of the year, or excuse me, by the uh, January of next year. But uh, we are also very closely monitoring uh, what the FASB and ISB uh, deliberations are producing. Um, there will be differences. Uh, certainly, uh, the board has tentatively decided to continue uh, to propose a single approach. You know, effectively saying that all uh, leases are financings, with of course the uh, current or, or short-term lease carve-out. 
but um, likely the board will not issue an exposure draft until we see what the final uh, lease standard is from the FASB side so that there's there's no surprises, no unexpected changes because the FASB made a, a last minute turn. Uh, fiduciary responsibilities, please folks, take a close look at this exposure draft when it came out. Um, when you look at the number of responses, uh, you know, look at external investment pools, we had 297 responses to the internal investment pool exposure draft. A lot of input from citizens, but uh, the PV, on um, the PV on on the leases, we had 37 responses, and the and the PV on um, fiduciary responses, we had 36 responses. Now there were there was a lot of state input, and we certainly appreciate uh, the feedback we get from from NASAC. But uh, for fiduciary responsibilities, I think that has slipped again. Another item that slipped under people's radar, and um, there will be major changes proposed here. Uh, related to what goes into a fiduciary responsibility with some things moving into governmental funds and other things moving out of the financial statements. So please monitor that project, take a, you know, follow um, our website and uh, project pages on our website. And when the exposure draft does come out towards the end of the year, please uh, be ready to give us your feedback. Um, just quickly moving on since I'm, I'm definitely uh, out of time here, but uh, when we look at pre-agenda items, uh, a, a couple of major things will be considered uh, this year, but probably the biggest one is the re-examination of financial reporting model. We've recently completed two years worth of, uh, you know, extensive research where we had roundtables, we, we had surveys, we had face-to-face -face interviews uh, with almost 150 participants um, where, you know, we've gotten a lot of feedback on what's working what's potentially not working with uh, Statement 34 is amended. And those uh, findings of our, our research have just been recently released to the board. Uh, we're going to have a discussion of that at the July meeting, and then at the September meeting, the board will make a decision about whether uh, we should add a project uh, on the reexamination to the current technical agenda. Um, so as you can see, we've, we've got a very busy schedule ahead of us, uh, but we can't do it without your input. Um, we always say all knowledge does not reside in Norwalk, Connecticut, and we certainly mean that and look forward to your input as we move forward with these projects and as we move forward with the implementation of the standards that we've covered today. So Kenny, with that, um, we appreciate uh, the input so far and look forward to any final questions that you may have. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate you running through that. I know we didn't have much time at the end. I would like to point out to everybody, we, we, we had a lot of slides in the deck. A lot of that's just for your reference. We really wanted to get through the main standards that were effective for June 30, 15 statements, as well as next year, uh, June 30, 16. So we, we did cover, you know, pretty much what we wanted to. The rest of that's in there for your, for your reference. Uh, Dave and Scott, there was one question that came in later on the pensions, uh, statement 68. I'd like to cover that real quick if we could. The question sure. was, with the guidance provided in slide 15, which talks about NCGA statement 1 and paragraph 42, would the guidance provided in slide 15 regarding allocation of the pension liability to the funds, which appears to address only liabilities, also apply to a net pension asset? Or could, for instance, the entire asset be allocated to the general fund of the cost-sharing government? Okay, it 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 is it, it, it's really intended though to to go both ways. Um, you know, even though the uh, the paragraph 42 was written from a liability perspective, um, it's it's hard from a conceptual basis to justify. Uh, you know, if this year it's a, a pension asset, next year it's a pension liability. Why it would transfer from one to the other? Um, so uh, again, that's not you know uh, there there isn't. That's not specifically addressed in the standards, so I want to make that very clear that that's an unauthoritative uh, response uh, to the question. Uh, but um, generally, we look at uh, you know these being handled in a symmetrical fashion. Thank you, Dave. It, it's encouraging to hear that somebody out there has a net pension asset. <laughs> well, we're we're aware of one we're aware of one state that has one. We're aware of another state that temporarily has one. 
<laughs> Listen, before we go, uh, Dave, I can't let you go without at least asking uh, one of your pre-agenda research project items was the financial reporting model. Uh, many of us remember and still have uh, battle wounds from GASB 34. Uh, if, if the board decides to move that from pre-agenda research to an agenda item, any idea when that due process document might appear? And I, I know I can answer for a lot of people in the audience, hopefully after I retire. <laughs> And that and that may be the case for uh, for Dave Out and myself. It, uh, but uh, the the goal uh, would be to uh, to attempt to get a, a you know a final standard on the street probably June of 2020. So uh, what that would allow for is uh, at least a preliminary views document. If not, depending on the extent of changes. Um, that uh, that could be proposed. We we may even issue an invitation to comment. So, uh, you know, with that that effectively almost a, a five year period there, it allows us to uh, uh, to go through extensive due process because if we're going to make any modifications to 34, we want to make sure we we give people as many opportunities as possible to provide us with input. That sounds great. Let's go ahead and wrap up. I know we are at the appointed hour. Uh, and conclude our webinar. I'd just like to thank uh, Chairman Bowd and uh, Dave Bean, Ken Sherman, Scott Reeser, uh, Jalan Su. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your knowledge and experience. Great turnout. I want to thank all the participants in the audience today for your questions. I thought we had some very good questions. Uh, also, just like to thank Anna Penniston of our staff here at NASAC, who handles all the logistics uh, that makes today's event possible. Just some housekeeping items as we wrap up. Uh, just a reminder for those of you wishing to claim CPE for today's training event, please don't forget to complete and send your CPE forms and the group sign-in sheet to NASAC. The information is listed at the bottom of your group sign-in sheet and the individual CPE form. Uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, please note the requirement that each group location appoint a room monitor to observe attendance and verify the accuracy of the CPE forms and please make sure that your room monitor signs the attendance record. Uh, for those of you attending as individuals, again, we had about 50 or so this, uh, this afternoon, please respond to the final attendance check as listed on the screen now. A little different test, but just type into the chat toolbar the following, I have completed the webinar, and after you type that in, please make sure you hit the send button uh, after, your type, after typing your response, and this will give us a written record of your attendance. Uh, one last thing uh, re regarding evaluations, we are using an electronic evaluation form in an effort to make our processes here more efficient. Uh, please provide, uh, room monitors, please provide the link to the evaluation form to everyone in your group today and those participating as individuals, you should have received a link directly to the evaluation form uh, individually. Hope everybody enjoyed the webinar today. Again, I want to thank our speakers and, and you as audience. In terms of future webinars, uh, NASAC's next webinar will be sometime in September. We don't have the exact date just yet, but we'll feature the State Auditor's award-winning audits uh, that were recently uh, given at the State Auditor's Annual Conference. We'll have more details on that soon and, and available at NASAC's website. Association of Local Government Auditors, their next webinar is September 15th on ethics. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can get more details on ALGA's website, algaonline.org. And also our colleagues at AGA, they are currently uh, developing their webinar schedule for the next fiscal year. Not yet posted on their website, but I just encourage you to check periodically agacgfm.org uh, for more details as they become available, and I'm sure they'll be available soon. That's it. Let's uh, go ahead and wrap up. Again, thank you to everybody. Have a great afternoon.